Our Jewish Intimacy series takes us on another part of the journey, but this journey starts with a story, a story that was actually nearly a hundred years ago, where a Dr. Ludwig Schweitzer met a patient, a patient that was in Africa, a patient that was in the community, that he was visiting on a medical uh, mission, where this patient was a cannibal, and he was actually one of the elders of the community. Dr. Schweitzer lived to tell the story so they didn't eat him, but he did learn something that we have to have an answer for. The elder cannibal said, you see, we eat people because we're hungry. We need them to survive. Why do you white people kill people like you just told me of what happened in World War I? That was the question he asked the doctor, and the doctor didn't have a response. Do you have a response? Perhaps you have a response of why you don't kill people, but do you have a response of why you're killing animals and why it's even permitted for you to kill animals according to the Torah? And the Ramban even said that the Torah says it's not only in allowed to kill animals, but it's even good for the animals and in fact an act of mercy. How does all this work? How does this connect to the ultimate purpose of creation? And needless to say, since this is the Jewish intimacy series, what does it have to do with intimacy? This and much more was discussed tonight in an extraordinary shiur full of wisdom of the sages you're not going to want to miss. Watch it, enjoy it, study it, and remember to share it, and always be holy. We're continuing our series about Jewish intimacy. This is our um, Tuesday night special. Even though we already had a couple of shows this week, we uh, couldn't miss this uh, series. A series by, by far is the most difficult one we've done over the years because it just goes into so many different avenues of life uh, that uh, it's just in a huge uh, amount of, uh, of learning that's necessary and preparation, Baruch Hashem, uh, also a huge amount of Yetzirah to try to get in the way of uh, the Shi'uin. Uh, so uh, with that being said, tonight's Shi'u is going to be for the Refuah uh, Shlema of Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana bat Sarah, Avi Mori David ben Asriya, Imi Morati Doris bat Jora, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noah hides, may Hashem bless each and every single one of you to continue to watch our shulim, continue to share them with people, and uh, certainly continue to uh, support our organization. Anyone that wants to get some of these uh, cards that I keep promoting, I don't promote them for money because we give them for free, but you can go to the Kiruv store uh, and uh, get yourself a bunch of these cards for free so you can give them out in your community. Uh, and there's obviously other stuff on, in the store that you can get for free. Go to bhkiruv.org, bhkiruv.org, and you get your stuff uh, for free over there. If you want to donate, obviously that's also uh, great because all of this does cost money. Uh, it doesn't just you know fall from the uh, sky, not money. So, Baruch uh, Hashem, we uh, had an extraordinary night with uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's uh, Torah and uh, some uh, wonderful guests and uh, now we're back to business with uh, the Ramban, the Holy Ramban but of course we're not going to miss out on any opportunities that we have to uh, continue learning from all of the sages and uh, tonight is no exception. Uh, the, uh, the Holy Ramban has uh, taken us on a journey, not just a journey that perhaps some people thought would be a journey just talking about you know, the ways of the world, where how a man is with his wife and a wife is with her husband. And unfortunately, uh, the world today is a little confused. Uh, people uh, forget that a man is supposed to marry a woman and a woman is supposed to marry a man. But needless to say, uh, the Holy Torah tells us that uh, the first mitzvah that uh, mankind received was to, uh, to, uh, to multiply. Uh, and uh, that's not possible unless it's a man and a, and a woman. But at the same token, intimacy requires a lot more than just a physical act. As the Ramban has been teaching us over these last several months, there is a spiritual preparation for it, there's a physical preparation for it, 
there's a mental preparation for it and now he's been taking us on chapter uh, four of this journey which is the uh, health preparation for it meaning what you eat you are what you eat as everybody knows and everybody has heard but the Ramban is giving us a health lesson from the sages that uh, certainly can help uh, all of us in one way or another last week when we discussed it we realized that uh, perhaps your favorite food uh, may be a, a delicious food but uh, your wife or your husband is disgusted by it disgusted by its smell disgusted by the odor that it uh, it creates not necessarily in the food itself but in the odor that it creates in the body and these are some of the things that perhaps not everybody thinks about unless they're on date night you know many times it's a uh, you know I, I, I talk to people that are perhaps you know new to Judaism and uh, new to the Torah and you know they it takes an adjustment an adjustment to date the Jewish way because in the secular world in so many words many times a person can meet somebody and act like husband and wife a few hours after they met this is obviously inappropriate according to all accounts but needless to say this is one of the ways of the wicked world the Jewish way of dating is that you're only going to date somebody if you're interested in possibly getting married to them now you're not going to know if you're you know interested in marrying that particular person before you go on several dates but you have to be interested in getting married now the common denominator between Jewish dating and secular dating is that usually if the person is normal they're both acting their best they're both looking their best and they're both typically smelling their best and this unfortunately is something that at some point or another some people forget about once they actually get married they figure that listen she's my wife already so what does she care if i take showers what if she cares if i eat this smelly food what does he care if i walk around with my pajamas what does he care if i don't uh, you know take care of myself what does he care the truth is everyone cares whether you are religious or non-religious everyone cares but at the same token this is something that you're not caring about purely for the sake of, uh, of lust. You're caring about because this is what you signed up for. This is what you signed up for. And when somebody simply stops caring as much about their, their, their significant other, their spouse, at least as much as they did when it was just a potential date, then obviously the marriage could go downhill. This is also one of the reasons why adultery has become, uh, has become a, almost a standard in, uh, in many secular marriages today, uh, simply because people uh, are uh, so uh, consumed with lust and, and, and the physical needs that there's very little value to an actual relationship today. So in the Jewish world, the relationship is everything. You know, the, what you build with your wife, what you build with your husband, how you communicate, how you build trust, how you build a home, all of those things are the foundation. But this does not mean that the intimate part is any less significant. It's also up there on the pedestal because a couple that cannot be intimate is a couple that's simply no longer a couple. They're just becoming friends, perhaps roommates. And this is not something that uh, is the ideal, let's just say that, the ideal circumstance. And in fact, if the intimacy is uh, no longer uh, in the household intentionally, the marriage has to be broken according to Jewish law. You cannot continue staying married to a woman that does not want to be intimate with you. You cannot continue staying married to a man if he's not willing to be intimate with you. And by intimate, we mean on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, not once every six months, you're gonna give him a semi-annual birthday gift. This is not intimacy. This is simply, you know, giving something to a homeless person, like Sdaka. Your husband and wife is not Sdaka. So intimacy many times is ruined not because of how a person looks like, and sometimes not even because of what he or she says. Sometimes it's simply because they don't take care of themselves and they ruin their attraction. And interestingly enough, you see that when couples unfortunately go through divorce the first thing they do after they go through the nightmare that's called divorce is they start taking care of themselves all of a sudden she she wears nicer clothes all of a sudden she's on a diet all of a sudden she puts her makeup on all of a sudden he's on a diet all of a sudden he wants a better job 
all of a sudden he started to groom himself all of a sudden he started taking care of himself and she started taking care of themselves and the best part is is that once they see each other again six or 12 months after the marriage many times they're just as attracted as they uh, well uh, that time as they were when they actually used to love each other before the divorce happened so if they simply would have done that during the marriage it may not have saved the marriage under all circumstances because many times it's not just about looks there's obviously a lot more that uh, leads to divorce but certainly it would help so one of the things that the Ramban simply reminded us of because this is something that really should be common sense in a senseless world eat food that does not make you smell bad even if everybody else likes it, everybody else eats it, if your spouse is disgusted by it, remove it from your diet. Even if it's literally the healthiest food that's ever known to mankind. It came down from Mars, arrived at your plate, and it's supposed to cure cancer. If your spouse is disgusted by it, you cannot eat it under the same roof as that person. You have to eat it somewhere else, and you have to eat it under the conditions where it's not going to make you disgusting to them. Because there are certain cultures that have foods that are disgusting to others. Now, of course, this does not mean that you have to be uh, like one of these lizards that uh, the uh, chameleon that changed its colors uh, based, on the, uh, based on its surroundings. We're not telling you to do that. We're simply telling you not to be disgusting to your spouse. This is also one of the reasons that under Jewish law, one of the most beautiful things that you can ever imagine that you have in a marriage is modesty. Now, of course, the secular world that has no concept of what modesty is frowns upon modesty and in fact mocks it. There are many idiots out there that make fun of modesty, think that it is old age, it is ancient, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, archaic and all types of other words but the truth is anyone that has adapted to a modest life knows it to be much more beautiful and in fact much more sensual than you could ever imagine why because the beauty is reserved for a certain time and place and has not become public property because even if somebody is the most attractive, beautiful, and whatever other adjective you want to use that's in your mind, most beautiful, extraordinary person on planet Earth, guess what? After you look at that person 10, 20, 30 times, you got used to them. They're no longer as attractive as the first time you saw them, and needless to say, no longer as attractive the second and the third time. After you've seen this person for 20 or 30 days in a row, the attraction deteriorates especially if you saw a lot of them if you saw a lot of this person because they're sharing their 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 beauty their outer beauty to the world they're walking around as if they forgot their clothes in the shower what ends up happening is that there's nothing else left for the imagination on the other hand when the beauty of a woman especially is reserved only for our husband to see and the only thing that the public sees is simply attractiveness she's an attractive person she's not attracting she's a beautiful person but she's not a, a, a immoral person she's not trying to get your husband's eyes to look at her as well the beautiful part is is that her husband now knows that when he is with his wife he's the only one that can enjoy the rest of that beauty and one of the most extraordinary things that we have in the Jewish world is that Ashkadosh Baruch Hu blessed us with many things. One of the things that he blessed the Jewish people is with beauty. There are many, many beautiful Jewish people. Now, of course, there are Jewish people that look like all walks and sizes. Some of them are beautiful only to their mother. Some of them are beautiful only to their father. Some are only beautiful only to themselves. And some simply you cannot even help. Needless to say, Akadosh Baruch Hu has somebody for somebody. There's always somebody for somebody. Now, one of the things that the Torah decreed that we have to put into our life in order to keep that beauty that's, an, uh, that's based on whoever thinks that person is beautiful, keep that beauty in such a safety lockbox that you never want that person to think that the other one is not beautiful. You never want to have that moment of, ah, 
That? You know, I know sometimes people like to make these funny videos or, or, or and then, then some of them are really funny. Where, you know, a guy wakes up, and uh, I remember this from a long time ago, uh, and a, uh, somebody wakes up, and uh, he, uh, uh, he uh, sees there's somebody next to him, he's uh, distraught, oh no, he thinks that he uh, drank too much the night before, he starts getting dressed, he runs out of the uh, out of the room, and he gets downstairs, and he sees a bunch of kids, he's not even sure what happens, and then he looks around and says, wait, this is all familiar, Where, why is this in my house? And then he realizes, oh, that person was my spouse. So, yeah, this is funny, but the truth is, the Torah wants to protect that marriage from that funny joke. It doesn't want that funny joke to ever become a reality. So one of the things that the Torah tells us is that when the husband and wife are intimate, it needs to be in a dark room. Why a dark room? Well, if I'm already allowed to enjoy his or her beauty, why can't it just be in open daylight, middle of the day? Because even if a person is extraordinarily beautiful, the satan will always make you look, especially if you're trying to achieve holiness, especially if you're trying to fulfill a mitzvah, the satan will always make you look at the one place on their entire body that perhaps is not your taste, perhaps is not, 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 not interesting to you, not attracting to you. It could be an extra hair that's growing out of their uh, shoulder that you never noticed before. It could be a, a, a mole that he has on his uh, uh, on his chest. It could be something so minimal and so ridiculous that in any other given day it would never matter to you. But on that day it does, and that could ruin the 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 excitement part of the marriage to such an extent that literally you have some people go to the point of divorcing, divorcing the the, the person that they have shared their life with. Why? because of something superficial, something ridiculous. So the Torah says, we want you to be able to see each other, but not like it's daylight. Not like it's daylight. It doesn't need to be pitch dark, but it doesn't need to be daylight. It needs to be dark. That way, you're never going to have this type of experience. So the beauty that you had in your mind is then matched with what you saw before you took the last step, and it stays that way. Needless to say, when it comes to our diets, when it comes to our food, a person needs to make sure that they eat to live and not live to eat. And that means that if a person has such a lust for food, they should simply shut down this lecture, go eat some food, satisfy their hunger, I don't know, go play with some toys. Why? Because this is not going to be relevant to you. You're not going to be able to keep up. Because if a person is addicted to food, he's not going to be want, willing to change. On the other hand, if a person wants to be a grown-up, he wants to be a better husband, she wants to be a better wife, and they don't want to necessarily live to eat, but rather they want to eat to live, then this is applicable to you. Because you're going to be willing to do what we spoke about last week, which is number one, not eat foods, especially not, not next to your spouse or anytime you're about to see your spouse, and needless to say, anytime you're about to see your spouse in an intimate way, that is disgusting to him. Do not eat anything that creates anything disgusting. And don't expect them to adapt to this new environment that you're creating with this aura around you that uh, you received from going to the uh, uh, Indian restaurant or, uh, or Pakistani restaurant or Israeli restaurant or Chinese restaurant that he simply hates. The reality is there are certain foods that are attracting to, to, to certain people and there are certain f foods that are unattractive. And a person has to take that into account, not based on their palates, on their tongue, but rather based on their brain cells. And what do they want? Do they want to eat food that's going to make them happy, but then miserable because their spouse is going to be simply always with a headache every single time they, uh, there's an interest? Or they want to say, you know what? This is good. This is delicious, but not today. Tomorrow, next week, next year, perhaps even next life. I'm simply not going to eat this because the outcome of it is simply too dear. These are some of the very basics. Now, on the other hand, we have certain people that have such a lust for food that, as I said a few minutes ago, they simply can't comprehend. 
They can't comprehend that their spouse just can't handle the food that they're eating and the smell that it creates. They can't understand why their, their spouse eats so much or, or simply doesn't eat. You know, there are some people that eat so much, you're not even sure if you're next to an animal or you're next to a human being. You know, as soon as the food comes, you're, you're really careful to even put to grab a salad or grab anything because they may just grab your hand and eat it. There are some people like that in the world. On the other hand, there are some people that are equally obnoxious where they simply don't eat. These types of people are unfortunately very, very particular about their diet, very, very particular about their, their, their health, which is good, but to a point. Because if you are with your spouse and you still don't eat, that starts to become strange. Because at some point, a person has to live. So again, everyone needs to know where the limits are and not to push them. The same thing also goes with people when we're already talking about food and eating. It's also important for a person to let, if he's going to go or she's going to go, to a, uh, to a uh, be hosted by their parents or by family for a period of time of three or five or ten days or whatever it is. And you know that you're going to have to eat there at some point. You can't fast for a week. Make sure that the people that are hosting you are aware if you simply cannot uh, settle for simply anything they feed you. You have to know that people are not going to take it well if you don't eat their food. They're going to think that you are suspecting them of, I don't know, poisoning you or feeding you not kosher. So again, these types of things are part of general uh, 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 good behavior. Now back to intimacy. You see, there are some people that are willing to ruin their marriage life willing to ruin their entire household just because of their lust for food. Either they eat too much, or they eat disgusting food, or any other number of, of, uh, of uh, uh, different uh, adjustments to what I just said. Now, this is something that if you speak to somebody, tell them, listen, perhaps you should cut down on those uh, Twinkies. Perhaps you should cut down on those uh, donuts. Perhaps you should cut down on, I don't know, this whatever it is that you're eating, because I'm not sure by the time I see it, it's already the next thing that you're eating. You're eating so much. On the other hand, there are certain people that, you know, eat too little. So if you tell them this, many times they're not going to tolerate it. They're not, they're not interested in hearing it. So we have to hear sometimes some wisdom from other people, not the types of people that you and I would want to be friends with, not the types of people that you and I would uh, perhaps even want to welcome them into our house and have dinner with. Why? Because sometimes the most extreme examples are the best examples. Now, of course, the Chachamim always delve into all aspects of life in order to arrive at the truth. Even if that means going into the secular world and investigating certain things. Anytime you meet somebody, if you if and he says that he studies Torah, that's always great. But if you find out that somebody's a posik, somebody's a writes a responses, you already know this is a different level of scholar because that means if you're a posik, you are an investigator. You're not just somebody that has ideas, you're not somebody that just, just has a sharp mind, you're an investigator. Because you have to investigate a lot of things in order to arrive at a real psak. And this is also one of the things that many people don't realize. They think that, oh, he has this opinion, he has that opinion, and therefore I can listen to any opinion. You don't realize that a posek is an investigator. And he's going to look at every single possibility before he arrives at a conclusion. Even if some of the things that need to be considered are foreign to us. Now, one of the chachamim wrote a sefer called Yached Levavenu Lemunatecha, which means uh, unify our heart to your to have faith in you. This was written by a Talmud Chacham named Rabovad Yachem. Rabovad Yachem. And he wrote this based on the lectures of uh, Rav Moshe Levi, Allah Shalom, uh, who Rav Ephraim, our own very dear Rav Ephraim, uh, you know, learned with his son for many, many years. And Rav Moshe Levi was one of the Gdolim, one of the giants, and he had a lot of wisdom uh, in all aspects. And this Rav Ovad Yechem, he took down what Rav Moshe Levi said, and he also added a few comments to it here and there. 
In one of the places, he brings up an historical account that came from a journal of a humanist, uh, a professor, a person that was very well established in a secular world, named Dr. Ludwig Philipp Schweitzer. This Dr. Ludwig, he came at the, uh, at the time of uh, about 100 years ago almost, or 80 years ago, and he built a uh, hospital in Africa. And he also went to different communities throughout Africa and to help the people there. And he said, and he wrote down everything that he did, and he also encountered many people that not only were not part of the, uh, the, the, the first world, the second world, they're not even part of the third world. Literally, people that were only things you hear about in, uh, I don't know, maybe like scary stories. And he went one time to a village of cannibals, people that eat people. And he helped them physically. Apparently, that's probably why they didn't eat them. But at one point, he writes an account of a conversation that he had with one of the elders of the community. And the elder, after hearing what happened during World War I, says words of wisdom. The elder of the cannibals, the person that eats people, gives wisdom to this professor. And he says to him, we eat people because we're hungry. We have to kill them because we're hungry, so we have to eat them. But why do you white people kill people if you're not going to eat them? What's the point? Why do you keep killing each other? Now, although the logic that he has is obviously strange, it certainly has elements of truth in it. On one hand, he's telling you the reason why we kill is because we need to kill to survive, meaning we need to eat. That's his logic. But even this illogical logic has an element of truth that actually throws that truth at the face of people that kill for no reason. For the sake of getting more land, getting more power, more reputation, money, all types of superficial things. And he says, why do you white people kill people? What's the point if you're not going to eat them? And he wrote this in his journal. Now, of course, Ar Chachamim reviewed all types of things throughout their lives and everything that we can possibly imagine is in the Talmud, including this. 1,500, 1,600 years before this story took place, we already have the same wisdom already in our Torah. In the Gemara in Masechet Ta'anit, in the name of Resh Lakish, he says that in the future, all of the animals will assemble and come to the snake and say to it, a lion claws its prey and eats it. A wolf tears its prey and eats it, meaning a lion eats its animal while it's still alive, whereas a wolf that's scared of somebody stealing its prey, he kills it and then he takes it somewhere else and then he eats it. These and all other animals derive benefit from their acts of aggression. But you, the snake, what benefit do you derive from biting people and killing them? Exactly! What the cannibal said 80 years ago. Why do you kill people? For what? You're not going to eat the person. This is not the movies where the snake eats the person. Why do you kill them? Why do you, for what? Says the snake in an answer to them. And the master of speech has no advantage. This is a verse in the Torah. Neither does the master of speech who maligns other verbally derive any benefit from harmful talk. The teaching here is also about Lashonara, somebody that speaks about other people in order to uncover things that they do not want known. Things that are true. You tell people about somebody else's divorce. You tell somebody else about somebody else's miscarriage. You tell somebody else about somebody else's uh, bankruptcy. You tell somebody else about somebody else's wealth. 
You tell somebody else about how you were invited somewhere and perhaps they weren't. All types of things that are truthful statements, these are called Lashon Ara. And to say Lashon Ara doesn't actually give anybody any benefit, including the one that says it. And this the Torah compares to the venom of the snake. The venom of the snake kills people, but the snake doesn't benefit from it. But from our perspective, the additional thing we want to learn from it is that this snake is going to be rebuked by the animals one day in essence, and this is obviously a parable, saying, what's the point of killing if you're not going to eat it? So, the truth is, we have to make sure we have a legitimate reason to justify our killing. What gives you the right to kill a cow? Why, just because you're stronger or smarter than it? So what? Just because you can speak a certain language? The cow surely also speaks a language you just happen not to understand. Shlomo Amelech knew the language of cows, knew the language of, of birds, knew the language of babies. So certainly they have a language. You just don't understand it. In fact, there were scientists that recently discovered that there's a language for the fruits and plants. And they're now working with different types of technology to try to decipher what is this language? How to determine what they're saying? They can uh, ascertain that there is a language spoken among all of these creatures that are growing with leaves and fruits and vegetables and trees and so on. It is certainly a language. We've already known that for many years. But now it's developed a step further where they're saying we actually can hear the language using special equipment. So what gives you the right to kill the cow or the sheep or the goat? Or any other animal. Needless to say, what gives you the right to kill anything. Now, if you say, I'm hungry, that's not justified if you at the same time say that you are better than animals. If you're saying, I'm going to eat, I'm going to kill in order to eat, then what makes you different than the cannibal? The cannibal says, I kill people in order to eat them. But you don't see yourself as a cannibal. So what makes you different than the cannibal? You say, well, well I'm hungry. Okay, so that doesn't mean anything. What gives you the right to kill the cow? Why well, didn't kill it? Somebody else did. Still, he only did it because you're going to pay him to do it. You're going to pay him. He's going to kill the cow after spending X amount of money raising it and so on. And eventually sell you each steak for 10 and 20 and 30 and 50 and 100 dollars. So he's going to kill this cow for you. What gives you the right to eat it? The cow had kids. The cow perhaps even had things it liked to do on the weekends. What gives you the right? You say, well, I, I'm serving God. Well, guess what? So does the cow. In the, uh, the, the writings of the uh, um, Rebbe HaKadosh, Rabbi Udanasi, he wrote Perek Shira, and he wrote the songs of the animals. Every one of the animals sings to God. And serves God in a unique way. And they sing verses from the Torah in their language. When the frog saw that David Melech was serving Hashem, says to the frog said, David Melech, I'm even better than you. You only serve Hashem once in a while. I serve Hashem all day. All day I call to Hashem. Blessed is his name forever and ever. The frog rebuked David Melech. So here we see that there is a dilemma here. We're saying we're better than the cannibals, we're better than the animals, but yet we cannot really quantify that. How? How are we better? If you're saying because you're stronger than the cow, you're allowed to eat it, then what makes you different than the cannibal? Might as well start eating people. Go find weaker people and eat them. Obviously, you're not going to do that, and hopefully not. But at the same point, it's yeah, you still have to justify eating the cow. If, on the other hand, says, well, I don't have a reason, then you have a dilemma. You have a act that is literally creating a holocaust for the chickens, for the cows. You're no different. 
than some of the most evil people in the world if you don't have a reason. Meaning, this is not a question you can avoid answering. This is like, oh, I don't care, I'm just hungry. No, no, no. You have to answer this question. If you are saying you are better than Adolf Hitler, you are better than all of these Nazi soldiers that murdered six million Jews and millions of other non-Jews, took advantage of anybody's weakness in any way possible, you're better than them. Fine. I agree with you. But do you know why? You're better than the cannibal. I agree with you. But why? Why are you better than the cannibal? What makes you better than him? Now, you can't say I'm smarter because some of the smartest people were in the Nazi army. You can't say I'm, I'm nicer. I mean, they're killing, you're killing. Well, they're killing people. I kill animals. Okay, but what makes you better than the animal? The Gemara in Masechet Psachim says that a person that does not learn Torah, a Jew that does not learn Torah, really does not have the permission to eat an animal. Doesn't have a permission, even if it's a kosher, deluxe kosher. The best kosher you could possibly find. Chalak, Bet Yosef, the best of the best. According to the Torah, like the real, real serious Torah, person who doesn't observe Torah mitzvot, person who does not learn Torah, has no permission to eat it. Why? The cow is better than you. The Gemara itself says in Masechim Psachim and several other places that a person that does not learn Torah, does not keep mitzvot, has no permission to eat the cow, even if it's kosher. Why? Because the cow is better than him. Because the cow is serving God. What's he doing? He's going against God. So what gives him the right to eat it? So at least here we get a hint that in order for us to be better than the cow and not be judged as a Nazi against animals, a Holocaust promoter against the chickens, we have to be doing it as part of our servitude of God. So now we get our first hint. We don't want to be the promoters of a Holocaust against the chickens. We don't want people to make all types of statements against us and say, you killed all the chickens. You have to have something to say to them, especially today in the liberal world. They may actually end up making a poster with my face on it saying, look, he's defending the chickens finally. Now, with all joking aside, we have to have an answer for these questions. Or else, we are no different than a cannibal, and needless to say, we're not better than the cows. What does all of this have to do with intimacy? We're going to get to that, Bez Hashem. Torah Akdosha says that everything that a Kadosh Bahu does is always good. The Vida Melech says in Psalm 145, verse 9, The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. Here the Chachamim tell us not only the wisdom of the Creator the beauty of the Creator, but also the mercy of the Creator. Where everything that He did, everything that He does, has mercy built into it. So of course the heretics and the atheists and the simple ignorance are going to say, well if He's merciful, where was He during the Holocaust? If He's merciful, why do little kids get cancer? If He's merciful, why are there abortions and rapes? If there that's because you're uneducated about what mercy is. Here the Torah Tusha testifies in the name of a Kadosh Baruch Hu that everything that he does is with mercy in it, including allowing that worm to be eaten by some bird, including that bird being eaten by some cat, including that cat being eaten by some other predator including that predator being eaten by a different predator, including that predator being hunted by a man, including that man consuming an endless amount of animals throughout his life. All of that, and including anything that happens that negative to that person, is with mercy in mind. It's with mercy as part of it. This is part of the inner workings of the creation. 
which is the journey that the Ramban is taking us on to understand a little bit, as much as we possibly could, of why the world works the way it works. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu is all merciful, that means he's all merciful to everything. He's good to everyone. Not just to you because you're a Jew, not just to you because you're a female, not just to you because you're older, not just you because you're a Holocaust survivor, not just you because you're a righteous Gentile, not just you because you're a little boy or a little girl, not just you because you're a Torah scholar. No, no. He's good to everyone and everything, including the ones he takes out of the world, including the ones that suffer agony and pain. But how could all of this be good? Now, we spoke about this to a certain extent last week in regards to the, the, the subject of reincarnation, a subject that you could literally make an entire series of a thousand lectures on and only touch 1% of the surface. But we already understand from last week that we're not here for the first time. Our body is, but our soul is old and has been here. There is no such thing as there's a, uh, uh, this, this baby. There's no baby soul. There are new souls that come to every generation from time to time, but there's so few and far in between, it's a statistical insignificance. It's, it's something that you cannot even count on even happening. So, generally speaking, as the Stipler Gaon says, as the Vilna Gaon says, as the Arizal says, all of us are reincarnations. We've all been here multiple times. And each time a person has been here, they had a mission to fulfill, a mission from God to fulfill, to serve God in a certain way. They failed at part of their mission, and therefore part of their tikkun, part of their rectification was to be reincarnated back into this life in order to fix what was not fixed or what they broke before. Sometimes they get reincarnated as a human being, Sometimes they get reincarnated as a human being that happens to be Jewish too. Sometimes they get reincarnated as an animal. Sometimes a plant. Sometimes even a rock. The Ben Ishchai, Allah Shalom, was once arrested and put into prison. And he suffered a lot in prison because he simply did not understand what he did in order to deserve going to prison because he knew it was right for him to be in prison because if the creator the merciful creator put him in prison surely he deserves to be in prison he just didn't know what he did in order to deserve this and he cried to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the prison and in his mercy HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him in a dream and he told this to his students years after when he left he says the dream uncovered why I was in prison there were certain wicked people that died and part of the reason that they got judged heavily was because they did not go to Shire Torah. They didn't go listen to the Torah. They went and they did all types of other things. Business, fulfill all types of lusts, waste time, play on the internet, whatever people do. Instead of listening to the Shire Torah, instead of paying attention to the Shire Torah, instead of studying the Shire Torah, they did other things. And part of their punishment was to be reincarnated into this world and to listen to Shulet Torah. But how did Hashem choose to make sure they listened to Shulet Torah? By putting their neshamot in the walls of my prison cell. And the only way that these neshamot could be rectified and elevated out of that prison is if they heard me learn Torah inside the prison cell while I was there. So here we see words of the Ben Ishchai of how literally there are neshamot everywhere. And each one of them is there for a reason. But the ultimate purpose behind it is that it's mercy. Hashem is trying to help it, not punish it. Now the help is painful, but needless to say, it's helping it because it's much better than destruction. So, one of the things that we learn from this and many other things that the sages teach us is that we have a permission 
from the Torah to kill certain things. Of course, if somebody comes to kill you, the Torah says kill him first. If there is war, of course, killing is not only permitted, it's a mitzvah. You have to protect yourself, you have to protect your people. But if somebody just makes you upset, doesn't uh, uh, pay you or anything like that, you have no permission to kill anybody. You have no permission to even hit them. On the other hand, if you want to kill for food, if the food would be permissible to you, meaning you're slaughtering a cow or a chicken or some other kosher animal, then certainly not only are you allowed to kill it, but it's a mitzvah to kill it. On the other hand, if you want to kill for joy, like you want to go hunting, like many people in the uh, world do, especially here in America. I used to have a few clients when I was on Wall Street that used to go hunting. And one time one of them invited me to his house, his mansion in, uh, in Texas. And as soon as I got to the house, I thought it was in a zoo. Only thing is the animals didn't move. It was a lion, there was bears, there was like all types of things there. But that was all stuck to the wall. He's like, yeah, you like them? I'm like, it's pretty cool. Well, wow, what is this? He goes, yeah, I go hunting. All of these you kill? He goes, yeah, yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah, all the animals you can possibly imagine. I think he literally caused some of them to extinct. So people go hunting. Are Jews allowed to go hunting for fun? The answer is no. You're not allowed to go hunting. Why? There's no benefit. It's called Tzar Baal Chaim. It's mercy. It's, 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 uh, it's wicked to do it. Because you're just causing anguish to the animals for no purpose. You're only allowed to kill an animal if there is a purpose. Now, if you're going to use this animal for something else, it's a different reason. The animal is there too for, for the purpose of man. The point being is, is that the permission from a Torah to kill animals, even if it's not for the purpose of consumption, even if it's, let's say, for clothing, otherwise, even that has to be over the foundation of the same mercy of how Hashem runs the world. Meaning, killing is permissible if mercy is the reason. Now, how can killing a deer or some other type of animal be merciful, even if you're killing it in a, in a kosher way, you're slaughtering it in a kosher way, so you're eliminating the, the typical pain that the non-kosher uh, way of killing causes, where you know the, uh, the average person uh, that doesn't know about Torah and uh, unfortunately grew up around anti-Semites, which are uh, unfortunately growing in the world today. There are many of them, especially because of the internet. There's a, literally a new anti-Semite jerk that's, bo that's born every day making uh, new videos out there. And more and more people that have never even met Jews, never learned about Jews, never learned about Torah, are quickly becoming anti-Semitic because they're taught to hate. And one of the arguments they have, the qualms they have about the Jewish people is that the Jewish people slaughter their animals. The truth is that if a person knew the difference between slaughtering an animal and the way their animals are killed, they would actually want to convert just because of that. The animal that's, that's slaughtered by a rabbi, a scholar, someone that knows how to slaughter an animal in a kosher way, he's slaughtering the animal in the most painless way, in a specific way part of its neck to eliminate the ability of the blood traveling to the brain in a single instant eliminating the suffering of the animal and whatever parts of its body continue to move that's only be only because of nerves not because of pain the animal is already dead but the non-kosher animals the way that they're killed is literally the most heinous vicious way possible they electrocute them sometimes they poison them Sometimes they just hit them until they die. And many times it takes a long time and you see these literally living dead. They're walking around and uh, suffering for a long time before they're, they're done. And many times after they electrocute them and they cause all of this anguish, the animals fall down, collapse, and swim inside their own excrement that came out of their body because of everything that happened, the trauma that happened to their body. Which means that all of this fecal matter is getting absorbed by the body. The very same 
that actually is going to be consumed shortly after in McDonald's or some other non-kosher restaurant. So one of the things that we have in Judaism is that mercy is a must. Mercy not only by the Creator, but mercy by the creation. If you want permission to kill, it has to be because of mercy. But real mercy, not delusional mercy. Where you just, like Hitler, he was mer he said he was merciful on the you know the people that were uh, uh, crazy, people that were insane, people that were disabled. So before the Holocaust caused the lives of millions of people, he actually killed tens of thousands of his own people, Germans. Why? They were missing a leg. They weren't able to walk. They, uh, they had uh, certain deformities. And he said that these people, older people, crazy people, all types of people, these people are, they have no right to live. So it's a mercy to kill them. And literally they allowed him to do this until the church got involved and, uh, and uh, put a stop to it. But this was one of the things that desensitized the Germans. Where once this very same evil monster told them, go kill as many Jews and other people that are, are not like us as you can. They didn't think twice. Why? Because just a few months ago, they were okay with killing their cousin, killing their brother, killing their next door neighbor. Why? Because he had a deformity that he was born with or something happened to him. So he lost his right to live. So if their own brother or sister, whoever it is, has no right to live, and that's mercy, why wouldn't killing a bunch of Jews and blacks and anybody else they could get their hands on also be an act of mercy? So the logic of the evil is evil in itself. But if a person doesn't understand the difference between good and evil, the logic of the evil is logical. So the Torah tells us that killing can either be an act of evil or mercy. It cannot be both. So, the Ramban tries to explain to us why we are better than a cow, why we have a permission to eat, and eventually getting us to what we are all here for is to learn and how this all affects intimacy. But this is a health lesson that all of us need. After telling us and bringing the verse from David the Melech that tells us that the Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. The Ramban says, Akadosh Baruch Hu taught us in this verse that the slaughter of animals and their consumption by man is beneficial to those animals and is actually compassion and mercy above them. So we discussed one aspect of it last week which is reincarnation there could be a soul in that animal he's going to discuss another aspect of it now and he says the following i will explain this it is known that every food that man eats goes to the stomach and from there it goes down to the upper intestine which is below the stomach and from whence the liver draws off the choicest parts of the food as well as the finest and cleanest fats of the food, and the remainder of it shunts off to the lower intestine, from whence it goes through the excretory tract, meaning it's out of the body. And those parts which the liver drew off are prepared, and it returns, into, it turns it into blood, and sends it cleansed to the heart. And the heart sends it to all of its limbs. So from here we see that we literally are what we eat because everything that you eat, regardless of whether it's an ice cream, it's a steak, it's a uh, kosher or not kosher, whatever it is, a certain part of it is going to turn into blood and blood is you. Now, as a reminder to us, the Ramban is going through this sort of biology lesson in order to also remind us of certain things we are supposed to take into account. Not only are you what you eat, 
But the better you eat, the better the blood. This is the reason why today, what the Rambam, the Maimonides warned us about 800 years ago, is unfortunately uh, being fulfilled, where you see a enormous amount more diseases today than you did 100, 200, 500 years ago, or any other time in history. Disease always existed. But the number of different types of diseases we have today is drastically more than any other time in the past. And the Rambam already warned us that all of these diseases have a connection to the diet, to what people eat. Because the better, the healthier the food, the better the outcome of this process that the Rambam just described to us, this digestive process, the better blood it creates. If you eat food that's not good for you, the type of blood that will come out of there is not going to be as good as it can be. And it's this blood will come to the heart and will affect the heart in a negative way. This is the reason why people that have terrible diets tend to eventually have all types of heart conditions. Now this is obviously for every uh, generality, there's always exceptions. There's some people that eat terrible their whole life and they live a long life. But overall we see that many people today have these health problems, these new health problems, malabsorption, celiac, all types of uh, allergies, all types of things that really we never had in the past. Part of the reason is because the food in the world has changed. There's a lot more chemicals that are put into it. A lot more junk is put into it. I remember when we were kids, one of our favorite drinks was Coca-Cola. And, you know, Coca-Cola was a flavorful drink. And I remember one time, this is already after I came to the United States, one of the kids told me, you should never drink Coca-Cola, it's not good for you. And the teacher supported what he said, saying, yeah, it's, uh, it's dangerous. Coca-Cola is dangerous? They sell it at the deli. What are you talking about? I bought it for $2. What's dangerous about Coca-Cola? What, sugar? Okay, sugar. But no, no. There's certain chemicals in acids that are in the Coca-Cola that literally uh, cause damage to the body. And one of them gave an example that somebody supposedly uh, put a tooth inside a uh, can of Coke and it dissolved. Another person said that there's a uh, conspiracy uh, which, of course, we have no idea if it's true or not. It's not relevant. But the point is that the conspiracy does exist. That somebody, one of the workers of Coca-Cola, fell into a pool of of, uh, of this Coca-Cola and, uh, and and not only drowned but literally consumed. And of course, a lot of this stuff could be mumbo jumbo. The point being is, it's no longer an argument that Coca-Cola is not good for you, though. Whether it consumed the tooth or not, whether it consumed all, that doesn't really make a difference. The the debate of how bad is going to continue. But the fact that it is bad, everybody knows. But yet people consume it as the number one drink in the world. So, the Rambana is telling us that yes, there are certain things that are going to be very, very popular and very tasty. But if you take your intimacy into account, perhaps you would reconsider. Maybe you don't care about your diet. Maybe you don't necessarily even care about uh, you know your looks but you do care about your longevity the one thing that is common among all sane people is that they have a desire to live the moment a person has no longer a desire to live becomes suicidal that person is declared insane he has to be instituted so the Rabbana is telling us that all of this food that you consume a part of it the best part of it turns into blood but even the best part of it is not necessarily always going to create the best type of blood and that will have an impact on the heart furthermore he says that after it goes through the heart the heart sends it to all the limbs and there in each and every limb it's processed for a third time the food then becomes flesh in the flesh fat in the fat bone in the bones sinew in the sinews for the body is nourished from this food 
It follows that when an animal is slaughtered for human consumption, it is for the animal's good. He repeats what he said before, and now he's going to elaborate why it's good for it. The animal is slaughtered, the animal dies. If it's consumed, it's for the animal's good. Now, of course, he's referring to kosher slaughter and Jewish people eating those animals. If the animal is uh, killed for no reason to be hung on the wall or to a, uh, 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 be consumed in a non-kosher way, the, uh, it's still an act of mercy. It's still, obviously, the, the hand of Hashem allowing it, but the benefit to the animal is not as much. So now, what is the greater benefit in this animal that's uh, slaughtered in a kosher way and consumed by a Jew? For it is uplifted from the level of the body of an animal to the level of the body of a man. And this is the way of all that is composed of the four element families of the lower material world. They are the minerals, plants, the non-speaking living things, and the speaking living things. The minerals draw from the four elements, and the plants draw from the minerals, and the four individual elements. The non-speaking animals similarly draw from the plants, the minerals, and the elements, and the speaking beings use the non-speaking animals, plants, minerals, and the four elements. This process proceeds in stages going higher and higher hierarchically until the cycle revolves forward and back. About this it is said, God is good to all. See here the Ramban is not only giving us a biology lesson, but he's also giving us a lesson about the ultimate tikkun olam the ultimate rectification of the world, the secret of creation. Where if we don't know or accept this secret, then a person cannot answer the question we asked before of what makes them better than the cannibal or the cow in a favorable way. They cannot justify eating even a potato. If a person is an atheist, because he doesn't want to believe in God, and then you ask him, okay, so you believe you came from some monkey. Fine. So you think that all animals, in essence, have the common ancestry. Fine. So what gives you the right to kill an animal and eat it? You can't say, because you're hungry. It's not, it's simply not justice. That's not right. So what gives you the right? And they will never have an answer. And if they say, no, I'm hungry, so therefore I eat. Okay, so how come you don't eat people? Oh, it's illegal. So go to a place in Africa and they eat people over there. Meaning, you're always going, without this answer that we're about to see, that we're about to understand further, there's really no justification for anyone to consume food. So... The Ramban is telling us that this is actually good for who we thought is the victim, the animal. Because the way that it's composed, the way that everything is composed, is that they're all coming from these, there's the four different types of uh, 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 levels of creation. You have the minerals, the plants, the non-speaking living beings, which is the animals, and then you have the speaking living beings, which is people. And then, of course, you have the Jew, which is a, uh, a creation of itself. That's what the, uh, uh, um, uh, some of the uh, sages uh, said in the, uh, the uh, uh, Rav Desla, Rav Desla, Shalom, he writes it. So, now, the Ramban is telling us that the minerals draw from the four elements and the plants draw from the minerals and the non-speaking animals draw from the plants. We see that each one of these creations gets its life source from the lower one. Starting with the plants, getting it from the minerals. 
But the minerals, getting it from the four elements. What are these four elements? There are four foundations that Hashem create, used to create the world. You have the fire, water, air or wind, and you have uh, the earth. These are the four parts, four materials that Hashem used to create the world. Now, these four elements, these four foundational uh, uh, tools that Hashem used are continuously affecting the creation, are continuously used, and are continuously affecting the way we interact with the world. Now the fish were created on the fifth day from water. The animals created from earth. The birds were a mix. God created them from a combination of water and earth. This is the reason, by the way, that the birds can fly. Because the less impact the earth has on a creation, the more it, gets, it can elevate itself above the creation, above the material. Now, a lethargic person is a person that has a bigger influence because Hashem created man from all four elements. Everything was put into man. So a person that's lethargic, a person that's slow to act, you know, there are some people that it's like a, you know, you say, listen, you want to come over to a shiur? Yeah, yeah, sure. When is it? Oh, it's in a, uh, it's in two hours. Oh, wow. So soon? Shh. I don't know, man. It's, it's, too, it's too, too short notice. What do you mean? You live 15 minutes in the place. What's short notice? I don't know. I have to get prepared. And I gotta. I don't know. I gotta do some. What do you have to do? What? What? I don't know. It's just. It's just short notice. Why don't you just tell me yesterday? You know, it's like if I ask you to go eat, you say, "Yeah, sure." Where are we eating now? But if I ask you to shoot to eat, it's like always slow. Sometimes even if it's to eat, you invite them to eat. It takes them five hours to finally arrive. Some people are that way. Some people are lethargic. I used to have a uh, a guy work for me. And literally, I would have to like constantly give him like a pep talk just to get him moving. Okay, go to the office next door and get me this, this, and this. Okay. And I'm looking, I'm waiting. You know, usually when somebody says, okay, that means they're going to go. So I'm waiting. Go! Something. And it's like he just, like he blanked out. You're not even sure what happened. Now, this happened once, twice, okay, fine. But it was all the time. And at one point I asked him, are you on drugs? Like you do drugs? Like I don't usually go into people's business. Are you on drugs? He goes, no, no, I never touched that stuff. Like, wow. Naturally like this. What a curse. Wow. Some people are like that. What does that mean? That means that the earth has a bigger influence on that person. Has a bigger influence on that person. So in order to get them going requires a lot more effort. On the other hand, there are some people that are very energetic. They are constantly going. They're always going somewhere. They're always working on something. You tell them, listen, we need to. They're already gone somewhere. They're already on the way to whatever they think you think they need to do. People call those types of people hyperactive. And unfortunately, in today's schools, there's like a... Uh, uh, a protest against such kids that are hyperactive. Oh, your son is hyperactive. You uh, you can't send him back to school anymore. Why? He's a kid. Hyperactive could be good. No, no, no. Can't handle it. You have to give him Ritalin. Well, what's that? That's well, going to calm him down. Once you see all the side effects from this Ritalin, that literally they're giving kids like it's Tic Tacs. They're giving it to kids like it's candy. And I wish I was only talking about non-religious schools. I'm talking about religious schools right now. They're forcing the parents to either give their kids Ritalin so they can become like a mummy or don't come back to school anymore. Of course, this is not all yeshivot, but there's enough yeshivot that I've heard this from 
the parents themselves crying to me, telling me, what do I do with my kid? And every time I'm going to tell them, don't give the kid Ritalin. Why? First and foremost, it has a lot of problems. Second of all, the kid itself, nine out of ten times, doesn't have a problem. He's just hyperactive. You're not going to uh, help him by giving him Ritalin. You're just going to kill the kid slowly. You're going to make the kid into something else. What, is he going to take Ritalin for the rest of his life? He's a hyperactive kid. The teachers obviously have a harder time dealing with those kids, but that's not the way to deal with it. You don't want to deal with hyperactive kids? Pick a different job. Go work in the zoo. Deal with the animals, maybe. Go work in a fire department. I don't know, save lives. Don't deal with kids. Why? Because six out of ten kids are going to be hyperactive. What are you going to give? It's going to become a, you're going to become a dealer of, of Ritalin to everybody? And unfortunately, this is something that's become so accepted among society and the parents are so scared that the school is not going to accept their kids that they're giving these kids these, these drugs. Why? Because the kid has an influence from the element of fire. That's the reason why he's hyperactive. It's not because he's a bad kid. It's not because he's deformed. It's not because he's an unusual kid. He's just not the lethargic kid. And he's just not the, let's say, the normal one that everyone idolizes and wants, which is rare and few and far between, because most kids are either extremely lethargic and slow, or they're hyperactive. Very few are this norm that everybody wants. But yet, they're forcing this among parents that you have to bring them to the norm. Why? By feeding them drugs. Before you know it, they're going to start telling, selling weed, selling uh, marijuana to kids. Why? To calm them down. Why? If you, what's the difference? What's the difference between Ritalin, this drug, or that drug? We don't like any drugs. But the point being is, if you're going to start promoting this and this becomes acceptable among society, it's only a matter of time before the other stuff is going to be accepted. You're going to have seven, eight-year-old kids smoking joints. Why? Oh, I need to go to school. What? But unfortunately today, because people are so removed from the truth of Torah and so uneducated, they don't realize that some of these things have been not only a part of society since the beginning of time, but have actually been the very same gifts that Hashem gave some of the greatest people that ever lived. One of the famous stories I remember year, reading years ago with my Rabbanit, and until this day, we always think about this story. Baruch Hashem, our kids, they like to be active. And sometimes, it takes a little bit of uh, adjustments, a little bit more than just an adjustment. You know, they want a project all the time. They're not just going to sit there and just look at the wall do nothing. You have to give them a project. You have to get them thinking. You have to get them doing something constantly. Some kids, I remember, I met a few people who had the kids, and the kid could sit there three hours, didn't see a single word. I remember there was used to be uh, used to be a few parents that would bring their kids to the uh, lectures and I would always be amazed at how does this six or eight year old kid just sitting there didn't say a single word for two or three hours while I'm talking now the adults I understand they're adults but the kid he's six he's seven he's eight years old a few times I even saw them younger than that ten years old how is he sitting there for three hours while this old man being me Talks. Just sitting there. Nothing. I understand he gets out there for 15 minutes, a half hour. But this kid, two, three hours every week. It's unbelievable to me. My mother, it's a gift. But some kids, in fact, most kids are not that way. Most kids, 15 minutes, I need a different project. Some kids, two minutes, they need a different project. So a parent has to adjust. If you're going to adjust just by feeding them drugs, it's better off not to have kids. And if you have some kids, give them off to normal parents, other Jewish parents to take your kids. Why? You're not a normal parent. If you want your kids to be mummies, go pick a different career. Don't bring kids to the world. Don't do anyone a favor. Kids are not supposed to be mummies. They're kids. That doesn't mean it's easy, especially not for the mothers. But don't drug your kids. Don't become some drug salesman in the corner. Say, you want, you want to get high? You want to, you want to, you want to get something? What does it do? Oh, it's going to turn you into a mummy. But I want to be a kid. Yeah, but your parents don't want you to be a kid. And your teachers don't want you to be a kid. In fact, everybody doesn't want you to be a kid except you. 
So we win. Why have kids then? So now, what a parent needs to know and what a teacher needs to know is that yes, you're gonna have some kids that are hyperactive, that are jumping up and down. And what is you, your job? Your job is to interest them enough where they are more willing to tame themselves, to adjust to the environment. So certainly you have to do something more for some of those kids. Sometimes you have to pique their interest with a little bit of theatrics. Sometimes you have to pique their interest with some uh, extracurricular activities. Sometimes you have to do what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai himself said. You have to bribe them. If you do this, I'll give you a toy. If you do this, I'll give you a candy. If you do this, I'll take you to the park. Sometimes you have to stimulate their mind. If they're bright kids, you have to simply start talking to them almost like they're adults and even like they're adults. So a person says, yeah, but what am I going to get out of this? And back to the story that I told you here, years ago, the sages from time to time would talk about themselves. We talk about themselves as when they were kids. And there's a book that uh, the Rabbanit uh, uh, got talking about the different Sadiqim, different sages, but when they were kids. Bunch of stories about different sages throughout the generations, but their stories from when they were kids. And literally you see that it's not uncommon for some of these great sages to be really hyperactive kids. But not even the hyperactive that most parents complain about. Like some of the stuff that these kids would do, literally, most parents would just leave the house, just give the house over to the kid. Say, okay, you took over, I'm finished, I gave up. You own her, you know, like, literally, some of the stuff the kids would do, it's like unbelievable. But that extra strength, when it was eventually moved or, or redirected towards the Torah made them powerhouses made them have the ability to learn and dedicate themselves to the Torah much more than the average person can much more than the average person can and one of the great sages that we've said stories about a few times that uh, they say about him that when Einstein met him, Einstein himself says, with his brain, you can make four Einsteins. He says himself that when he was young, he was so hyperactive. He was so all over the place that no one would survive teaching him. And that's why he owes everything to his Rebbe in kindergarten and first grade and second grade. Why? He says, because he found a way. He found a way to teach me. He knew I'm not going to stay in class. He knew I'm leaving class as soon as possible. As soon as somebody's not looking, I'm out of there and I'm going to climb a tree. You know what he did? He left. He went to the tree and he would teach me while he's on the bottom of the tree and I'm on top of the tree. And he would say the Mishnah on the bottom and I'd complete it on top. He would say the sugya on the bottom, I can put it on top. And he would teach me in that way. Now, of course, teachers like this are as rare as you can possibly imagine. That's what I always tell parents. Don't invest in the drugs. Invest in better teachers. If you can't get that teacher in the yeshiva in the school day, get him a tutor. And pay him enough money that he simply wants to be that guy. Even if he's not. Naturally, this type of teacher, pay him enough money that he's simply motivated to do it. But unfortunately, many times people want the greatest education to come for a discount. It doesn't work that way. Nothing good can survive if it's simply for free. There has to be a price. There has to be a sacrifice. And especially when it comes to teaching. So, the... Teacher teaching the kid when he's on top of the tree is always something that the Rabbanit and I think about, like, I may have to do this. We may have to do this with this. And you think about it, it's like, well, hopefully, 
you know, Hashem has mercy on us because I don't know if I could uh, climb any trees, but, and you start thinking, wow, this is not something that we're the only ones that have to deal with it. This is something that other parents have to deal with. And you have to figure out, okay, how do you do this? And you learn from experience and you realize, why did Hashem give this to me? This is not just because the kid is influenced by fire, but also sometimes because the adult is also influenced by fire and it's time for the adult to calm down. So it's one of the ways that HaKadosh Baruch Hu forces some of Musar, some of rebuke on you to calm down, to have more patience. So the difficulties are not a punishment, but rather an act of mercy. Needless to say, the elements or tools that HaKadosh Baruch Hu used and uses in creation have an influence on the creation. If there's more earth, that person will be slower. If there's less of it, that person will be more easygoing. If there's more fire, that person will be more hyperactive, also more prone to getting angry. And there are certain pluses and minuses with everything. And the job of a person is to put themselves in the best place they can by taking advantage of whatever was already given to them. Don't try to turn the fire into earth. And don't waste your time turning the earth into fire. It's not going to happen. What you can do, though, is learn how to utilize whatever you do have to the best of its ability. Whether that is you, or your kids, or your students, or whoever it is in your life. Don't try to change people into what they're not. Try to make the best of what they already are. Now, the tzaddikim elevated themselves spiritually in such ways that they were able to perform what we call miracles. As we spoke about in the lecture last night, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, his level of holiness was literally lethal. That any time somebody would simply do something that was completely against what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai believed to be the truth, it was very possible that that person would lose their life on the spot. Now, other times you have sages that there's stories about them, there's accounts, there's witnesses that saw things that were supernatural in many different ways. And one of the things that's relevant to us is the stories about the Shach and also the Divrei Chaim. Both of these sages elevated their the material, elevated their bodies to the level of spirituality where they were able to levitate in the air on a regular basis among people. People would call this flying. They would levitate on a regular basis. No tricks, no hidden stick, you know, stuck in the ground like some of these con men that pretend like they're elevating into the air. No, no, really, literally elevated the, whatever tools Hashem gave them to such capacity that they distanced themselves from earth enough to be like, almost like a bird. Now, of course, a person that is unfamiliar to Torah at all thinks this is nonsense, comic books. Sure. A person that's very familiar with Torah knows that this is not a new thing. There's other people mentioned in Torah, including Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, that is said to be uh, flying in the air. Pinchas, ben Elazar, ben Aaron Akoin. When he killed uh, Bilam, he killed him flying in the air because Bilam flew in the air. All of the things people see in comic books and, and all the X-Men and uh, Spider-Man and all this stuff that they see in the movies, all of it comes from the Torah or the original idea does. And many times you'll see that the original storyteller of these comic books was a yeshiva bachu that learned the Midrash, that learned the Gemara and simply stole the idea pretended like it's his own idea, 
by manipulating the idea and customizing the idea, instead of it being Moshe Rabbeinu, he turned it into Arthur, instead of it being Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Akwen, he turned it into Superman, instead of uh, Hulk, instead of uh, Yehuda, Labdi Yehuda ben Yaakov, he turned it into Incredible Hulk, and uh, instead of uh, uh, Naftali, he turned it into Flash, and so on and so forth. And many times you see that, yeah, okay, so he put a cape, he put a strange costume, he put him in modern times among the city, flying around buildings. But reality is that the powers, the abilities, the story, the plot, many times comes from the Torah. So anyone that believes in the Torah knows that these are basics in the Torah. So to say that someone was able to levitate in the air a few hundred years ago or less is not a new thing to anyone that's familiar with Torah. But either way, the purpose of it is not to say that you are not going to be able to fly tomorrow or even ever in our life, but rather to say that if they can get to a point of elevating the material that Hashem created them with to such a level, then at the very least, we can elevate ourselves to simply be better than what we are. 1% better, 10% better, 50% better, no flying, nothing supernatural. Just simply better people. Better husbands, better wives, better children, better. You don't need to fly to be better. There are plenty of villains that were able to fly. Bilam was able to fly. Flying doesn't make you better. But if you use the Torah the way you're supposed to, that will make you better, even without flying. So here the Ramban is telling us that these minerals draw their life from the four elements. And then the plants draw their life from the minerals and the four elements. And then the non-speaking animals draw their uh, life from the plants and the minerals and the elements. And all of this eventually climaxes at the human being taking advantage of everything in creation. And God is good to all. Meaning that all of this is a systematic, precise, perfect, merciful part of the plan. The elements rise to a higher level than themselves this being the minerals. The minerals rise to a higher level than themselves, this being the plants. The plants rise to a higher level than themselves, this being the animals. The non-speaking beings, which are able to move about and grow and are composed of the basic elements, these non-speaking beings rise to a higher level than them. They are the speaking beings who have the ability to speak and move about. And they are composed of the basic elements. And so we find that all of them become food for others in order that they may rise higher than their own level. So we see from here that Part of this merciful plan is to allow the consumption of each and every one of these creations in order for that to give life to a better one, to a higher one. As we see, part of the process is that the plant cannot elevate itself to become part of the animal without it losing its shape, losing its existence. It cannot be elevated without losing its existence. And the animal cannot sustain life without consuming the plant. So we see that these are codependent. The, the animal depends on the plant in order to sustain life. And the plant depends on the animal in order to elevate its life to become better than what it was, higher than what it was. 
Now, one of the benefits that kosher food gives to the Jewish people is that it not only a, uh, keeps them away from certain diseases that are only found among people that eat non-kosher food and also certain uh, 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 things that simply are uh, a mystery altogether, but uh, it also keeps them away from spiritually becoming deformed. What do I mean by that? If a person allows themselves to consume simply whatever moves, and if it doesn't move, they kick it and then eat it, then that person is not distinguishing themselves from the very same animal that they're consuming. In fact, the animal is not being elevated, but rather it's actually uh, perhaps even going down a level by being consumed by such a person. Now, how does food affect a Jew in such a way? Now, you could say that it affects him in a spiritual way. As the Torah says that when a Jew eats non-kosher food, he becomes spiritually stupid. He can learn Torah but not understand. He can learn science, he can learn history, he can learn math, and he can excel. But when it comes to Torah, when it comes to spiritually elevating himself or herself, they're not going to be able to so long as they eat non-kosher food because it's affecting the neshama. But at the same token, this spiritual diet of eating kosher food also allows the Jew to elevate themselves, not just spiritually, but also in the way that they behave, by learning how to control themselves. A couple of students of the Khatam Sofer testified of how kosher food not only saved them from going to Gehenom, but saved the entire Jewish community. One time there was a, at the time of the Khatam Sufil, there was a evil decree that was targeting the Jewish people. The Khatam Sufil sent two of his students, two of his Talmudim, to go and meet with the mayor and give him a letter that the Khatam Sofer wrote asking him to remove this decree. The students traveled far away to this mayor and the day that they got there finally was a very difficult weather. It was freezing outside, it was full of snow, it was a storm and they finally arrived at the place. They arrived at the mayor's mansion and uh, they were let in. And as soon as they came in, the mayor welcomed them, had them sit. And then his servant brought two cups of hot milk to them and one cup of hot milk to the mayor. And the mayor says to them, I'm sure you could appreciate a nice, warm cup of milk on such a day. You know, he's being gracious to them. Now, of course, these two Talmudim know that it's forbidden for a Jew to drink the milk of a non-Jew because you don't know where it came from. You don't know if it came from a cow or it came from a different animal. And therefore, you have no permission to drink it. But then they thought to themselves, if we, we're here to beg him, practically, to not only accept the letter from our rabbi, but also to accept what he says and remove this decree that's putting Jewish lives on the line. So if we tell him, listen, we don't want your milk, he may take it the wrong way. He may simply say, oh, you think you're better than me? You don't want to drink my milk? Well, you Jewish people don't drink. Oh, you think that our milk is bad? And he can make the decree even worse than what it is. On second thought, we're not allowed to drink it. And literally quickly within moments, these two Talmidim decided it's not up to us what he's going to do. It's up to God. We are in control of what we can do. What we can do is say we're not allowed to drink it. And they said to the mayor, we're sorry, we appreciate the 
offer and a generosity and a welcoming, but according to our Torah, we're not allowed to drink this milk. So the mayor was a religious man. He had a faith, he was Christian. And he said to them, why are you worried? Surely we both drink cow's milk. So there's nothing for you to worry about. This is cow's milk just like you drink. And they said to the mayor, again, we appreciate the offer and the generosity, but according to Jewish law, it's not something that we're allowed to drink because we would have to have some rabbi supervise to make sure that it is. Now, before the mayor can speak back to them, his servant comes back in. And as the mayor is drinking some of this milk and enjoying himself, the servant says, Master, I want you to know that the milk may taste a little different today, but that's only because our typical milk that we get from the cows was not available today due to the storm. So in order to make sure that you have your favorite beverage, especially for your guest, we got it from the pigs today. And he walks out. Now to the mayor, this is not a problem as far as drinking cow's milk, drinking pig's milk, drinking camel milk. There's no difference for him. He's a Gentile. He can drink whatever milk he wants. The only prohibition they have with food is don't eat an animal while it's still alive. Don't be a tiger or a uh, lion. Kill the animal, then eat it. Any animal you want. Drink whatever you want. No problem. But the Jew has laws. But this mayor got the point. As soon as he heard this, he put down the milk, his face was serious as can be, and he says to the two Talmidim of the Chatam Sofer, I see that this is clear divine providence that your God cares about you, loves you, and wants me to listen to everything that your rabbi wrote in this letter. And therefore I will. He read the letter and he canceled the decree on the spot. Meaning that logically, these two students, these two Talmudim could have justified drinking the milk. Number one, it looks the same. So you can assume it's cow's milk. Number two, the nice host Although he is Christian, not of the same faith, he's still being gracious, he's still being nice, he's still being generous, unlike many others that are of the same faith. He's telling us that it's cow's milk because that's what he drinks. So we have his word for it. Number three, and bigger than all, lives are on the line. If we offend him, it can actually make everything much worse and people can die as a result of this. Torah says you don't do those things. You don't do that accounting. You don't do that accounting. You do what you have to do. Don't worry about what God does. And that was the test. The test that saved lives. The Ramban is telling us that if a person looks at things from a superficial, atheistic, heretical way, then at some point they're going to have a dilemma justifying their own existence justifying their superiority to anything that's around them on the other hand the more a person cleaves to a kadosh baruch Hu in his torah the more they see why hashem made humans superior to the other animals the other creations and in fact, why he created all of those other creations, the animals and the plants and the minerals for the sake of the person. And yet, it's still a benefit to those animals and plants. Meaning just because eating an animal is beneficial for the man, doesn't by default mean that it's good for the animal. But here the Creator created a world 
where everybody benefits because he is the ultimate good. How can you make killing the animal, the plant, something good? When you have all the information that shows that it's all an act of mercy in order to elevate every part of creation to something better than what it started. And each and every single one of us has the ability to be better than what we started. And that's why the Gemara says that if a person, if a person does not learn Torah, they're not better than a cow. In fact, the cow is better than them and they have no right to eat the cow or any other animal. Because the cow, at least, is serving his purpose. If you're not learning Torah, you're not serving Hashem, what purpose do you serve? You didn't come to this world just to enjoy the physical parts, because that at some point ends. You didn't just come to this world in order to consume things, because that at some point ends. There has to be more. There has to be more to life. There has to be life after life. And if a person starts looking at life from that perspective, they can start seeing, wow, this may be ugly in your eyes, gruesome in your eyes, vicious in your eyes, before you learned how it's all part of mercy in order to keep man able to go higher, but also allow the minerals, the plants, the animals, and everything else keep him in the game of being able to elevate themselves even higher. Keep everybody on the same track where they can all become better than what they started. This Rabutai is the ultimate act of mercy because it shows us that it's not just theoretical that God is good. But in fact, if you, the more you learn about God, the more you realize that it is impossible for Him to be anything else other than good. Even if something hurts, and there is punishment, and there is death, that is all part of the ultimate plan that's beyond the scope of our abilities and knowledge and comprehensions, but at least the parts that we can understand show us how great he really is. If a person uses this information to elevate themselves, to motivate themselves, to elevate themselves, reminding themselves that, yes, it doesn't, I, I grew up one way. I knew life one way. But if the plant can grow and the cow can grow, and it's all sustaining me, then certainly I can grow, no matter where I started and how I started. Because the moment that you realize that growing and becoming better is your part of your ultimate purpose, then that in itself becomes a motivation to become better in every aspect of your life. One of those aspects is to create life. Create life by bringing new life to the world. Create life by bringing life into the world that you already have, which is meaning that a lifeless marriage, a lifeless household can easily be revived if you add Torah to it. And if a person listens to the Torah, they're never going to lose, even if sometimes it seems against logic. It's against logic that if you farm in half the field, you'll get more crops. But that's the truth. The Gemara says that if you have a full field, don't plant your crops on the entire field, the entire piece of land. Only use half the land. And let the other half rest for a year. And you'll see that the half that you're allowed to, uh, to uh, rest becomes better and the next year produces double of what it typically does while the one that grew the first year it goes to rest 
So while logic tells you the more land that I use, the more crops that I will have. Divine truth says, no. If you let half of it rest and half of it work, you'll end up getting even more. Sometimes what's logical is simply not true. And sometimes truth is something that is unknown to most people. It's not common logic. Where do we always have truth? We have truth in the Torah. And when a person looks at how the Torah views food, automatically now has a little bit of a different perspective on food. In the beginning we said that somebody that is has a lust for food to the point where they can't control themselves and they spend a half hour a day just thinking about what they're going to order or make for lunch, most of what we talked about is almost going to be irrelevant for them because they simply can't see beyond the meal. But if a person can see beyond the meal, they've survived an hour and a half already listening to this, then already they know that the next time their wife gives them food, the next time their husband gives them food or they go out to eat food, don't make such a big deal out of the food if it's not touching every taste palate that you have on your tongue, if it's not the most delicious. Somebody that complains about food is somebody that doesn't understand the purpose of food. In fact, doesn't even understand the purpose of why we're even in this world. But unfortunately, many times a person can ruin Jewish intimacy, not just because of smelly food, not just because of their lust for food, but simply because they're too opinionated about what determines good food or bad food. And they're so picky with food that they're just not pleasing to be around. The Ramban is trying to teach us this entire lesson in such a fashion that we know the entire process has a purpose and that knowledge replaces the nonsense that we have in our mind which is that yeah the purpose is for it to taste good the purpose is for it, for it to 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 make everybody happy the purpose is okay yeah hopefully it tastes good but that's not the purpose that's just simply a bonus the purpose is for it to give you the ability to live now if you living requires other people to suffer because you torture them and yell at them and insult them as a result of your desire for it to, to taste good, then not only do you not know the purpose of creation, but you're actually ruining the creation. Exactly what HaKadosh Baruch Hu warned Adam Alishon from doing. Adam Alishon was shown not just what was in front of them. A Kadosh Baruch Hu elevated, lifted Adam Elishon above the creation, and he showed him the world. He said, this is the world that I created. Don't ruin it. When a person makes food such a priority in their life, it has to taste a certain way, it has to be a certain amount of calories, it has to consume a certain part of your day, it's that big of a deal. Not only do you not know the purpose of food, and not only do you not know the purpose of life, but you're actually ruining the purpose. You're ruining the marriage. You're ruining the everything. Don't make such a big deal out of food. Eat healthy to the best of your abilities, but not at the cost of making your life unhealthy, your marriage unhealthy. Our goal here is to elevate the food, but not at the cost of destroying things in a forbidden way. In the Sefer Achtod Li Israel by our own dear Rabbi Freyim, in volume two, Towards the end of the Sefer, he has a section called Aarot al Sfarim. It's a, uh, a different uh, commentaries or debates with other Chachamim that he wrote. There was a Sefer called Likutes Gulot Israel. Likutes Gulot Israel, it's a Sefer that was written by Tlamit Chacham. 
And here he brought different things, different benefits, different warnings about food and so on. And Rabbi Ephraim brings in Daf uh, Gimel uh, section Tet Zayin a zgula of how to elevate food. Certainly, kosher with a, uh, a great kashur, that's all prerequisite. But how do you make food something that doesn't hurt me, harm you? Some people have food that harms them, whether it be allergic to it or it's something that uh, causes them to become very tired, uh, something to all types of things. He says this sgula ch- checked, verified, and it works. Sgula de Adam Shelo Yimashech Lo Shum Nezik Meachilato. This is a sgula that he will not have any harm from food. That the food won't harm him, won't make him tired, won't, you know, won't harm him. What's this sgula? He says, before he begins to eat, aside from obviously the blessing, before he begins to eat, before the blessing, he has to think in his mind that he's only eating for the sake of of allowing his body to live in order to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, have strength to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu and learn Torah and do mitzvot. That's why he's eating. He's not eating because it's delicious. He's not eating because other people eat. He's not eating because you're just supposed to eat. He's eating in order for the body to live so the body can serve God. And even has a nusach, a prayer to say that I'm here to fulfill this mitzvah of allowing my of, of keeping my body alive that our my creator commanded on me in order so I, so I can eat in order so that I can learn and delve into the Torah the holy Torah and may be his will that no damage will happen to my body from this food and there will be uh, uh, there will be a uh, Awesomeness, uh, you know, great things happening from it, even miracles. Due to the one that is toiling in a mitzvah, has the protection of the mitzvah, in so many words. See here, he's telling you, if you say this and mean it, before the blessing, the food's not going to harm you. The food will become elevated. And you will become elevated. Now, of course, this is an adjustment that all of our lives requires, or at the very least, should require. But the point being is, is that these are different tools that our Chachamim teach us in order for us to see that there are some difficult ways to elevate ourselves, but there are some much easier ways. It only requires willpower. If you want to have Jewish intimacy, get to the most extraordinary, beautiful, pleasurable, holy level it can be, all it requires is effort. That effort gets its energy from willpower. That willpower gets its energy from learning that creates desire. Just like the elements feed the minerals and the minerals, the plants, and so on, everything else in creation works the same. If you want more, do more. And now we have some more details of simply how to do it. Thank you for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of you that has learned, that has studied, that has taken some notes, and that's, at the very least, going to try to apply some of these things to their life 
And even if it's not applied right away, they're thinking about it. And if you're thinking about it, it may very well come true. But I promise you, if you heard it, that's because God made sure that you know that you can do it. No matter where you started and where you are right now. I shall bless each and every single one of you and give you the willpower that will sustain all of the other parts in order for you to achieve success. We'll learn again tomorrow in our series of Stump the Rabbi where we learn about different parts of the parasha and then a bunch of questions that hopefully Kadosh Baruch Hu will give you and the same token give me the answers too. And we'll study again tomorrow. Go to